can can we just can you can you tell me how to see um Rachel I guess maybe it doesn't I mean I'd like to see her but I don't Maybe know if you put it on gallery view, Jill. And where's the views? Is that in settings? Sorry. Up I in the top know? right hand corner. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay. It's so great to see all of you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Did you figure it out, Jill? No, I'm sorry. I'm just Sophia will write up. notes to you directly into the okay. chat. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. No problem. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jennifer Franklin, and I am program director of the Hudson Valley Writer Center. We're so happy to have you with us tonight to celebrate the new novels by Rachel M. Harper and Jill Bylowski. As always, I want to thank our founder and founding editor of Slappering Hall Press, award-winning poet, Margot Taft Stever. I want to thank the board and our teachers and students who are the beating heart of the center and the foundations and organizations who support us, including NISCA and Arts Westchester, who gave us a generous Restart the Arts grant for funding our reading series through the end of 2022. Thank you so much to my colleagues, Sophia Bannister, Christina Papadopoulos, and Natalie Sir for all of their hard work. This is a particularly meaningful reading for me to host. Jill Bielowski writes, especially in her latest book, The Deceptions, about all the subjects that obsess me in my work myth, betrayal, desire, the way books saved me, the conflicts and turmoil between familial commitment and commitment to one's art, the Metropolitan Museum, and ekphrastic poetry. Rachel Harper and I were lucky enough to be assigned to the same academic advisor at Brown, Arnold Weinstein, in our very first year. And both of us took his incredible class, Exile and the Conditions of Writing. And Rachel's father, the late beloved poet, Michael S. Harper, was my other college mentor. And without him recommending Rita Dove's Thomas and Beulah, I would not have written my senior thesis about my grandmother and her sisters growing up as Sicilian immigrants in the Bronx that won an award and got me into my MFA program at Columbia and a grant that paid for my first year there. So thank you for, for sharing your, your work with us tonight, Rachel and Jill. Rachel M. Harper is the author of three novels, The Other Mother, a Time Best Book of the Month Award winner in May, 2022, This Side of Providence, shortlisted for the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence, and Brass Ankle Blues, a Borders Original Voices Award finalist and Target Breakout book. Her short fiction has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and her poems and essays have appeared in numerous anthologies. Harper has received multiple fellowships from Yaddo and McDowell and she was profiled by The Root as part of their city series on Los Angeles Black Literary Giants. A graduate of Brown University and the University of Southern California, Harper is on the faculty at Spalding University School of Writing. She lives in Los Angeles. Alice Walker, author of The Color Purple writes, the other mother is a page turning generational saga about a young man's search for a parent he never knew and a moving portrait of motherhood, race, and the truths we hide in the name of family. Publishers Weekly says, Harper skillfully layers the narrative with accounts from various characters' point of view, capturing palpable emotions and the fissures running through their fraught relations, all the while handling themes of motherhood, race, and sexuality with aplomb. This adds up to a heart-rending story. When Rachel was in conversation with Jacqueline Woodson at Powell's Bookstore, 
she talked about the fact that she has been working on the other mother for a long time, even before she wrote This Side of Providence. She said she felt that she needed to become a better writer and grow emotionally to really write these characters and feel her way into every character's behavior. I am so excited to hear Rachel read from The Other Mother. Please help me welcome Rachel M. Harper. All right, thank you. I, I'm unmuted, right? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm so happy to be here with everyone tonight. And uh, the Hudson uh, Valley Writers Center also holds a place in my heart because back about 25 years ago, I was actually with my father in person and we did a reading there in the little like train station um, and it was one of my first readings ever. I was totally nervous. Um, and I was reading just a few poet poems with him and it was a Father's Day event. Um, and I still have a little poster from that event that means a lot to me. So I'm thrilled to be back virtually all these years later and reading from the other mother. Um, tonight, I'm gonna read from two different sections. So you get to hear a little bit of, uh, from different parts of the book. First, I'm gonna read the opening scene from book two. So as Jennifer indicated, there's multiple narrators. It's a, it's a sort of a sweeping family story, um, you know, about two women who have a child together uh, and break up and, up and, and then the child is raised by his biological mother and doesn't know that the other mother was ever involved. Um, so the scene I'm gonna read from First is when the two women first meet in college. So it's from Marissa's uh, point of view who goes on to be the biological mother and then Juliet is the uh, other mother. Marissa would later admit that she noticed Juliet's hands first, long fingers tapered like candles, her palms square and flat like a deck of cards. Her skin was the bronze that made Marissa think she was Cuban as well, and when she handed her a drink, rum and Coke in a paper cup, she asked her in Spanish if she liked the music. The bass was so loud it made the room vibrate. It was her first college party, just one week into freshman year. The girl, she didn't know her name yet, shook her head. It was clear that she spoke Spanish or at least understood, but didn't care to speak it back. Where are you from? Marissa had to yell over the song, British punk that had snuck into the top 40. She wondered what they were so angry about and why American teenagers were so fascinated by that anger. Here, the girl answered, flashing a vicious smirk. She pointed down at the floor with one hand, nursed her drink with the other. You grew up here in this house? They were standing in a 200 year old Victorian turned into an Ivy League version of a frat house. They both laughed at the absurdity. Only a few blocks away actually, just off Hope Street. The music stopped as the record came to an end. Everyone in Providence seems to live off hope, Marissa said. The girl finished her drink in one swallow. That should be a bumper sticker. I think it is, that's probably where I got the idea. Marissa laughed again harder than she needed to. She stuck out her hand, not sure what else to do. I'm Marissa, I'm a freshman. The girl shook it hard, like she was used to shaking hands with men. Juliet, she lifted the cup to her mouth, chewed on the ice that remained. Are you a student? It was a dumb question, but Marissa just wanted to keep talking to her. Juliet shrugged, for now. She walked to the bar, a plastic cooler wedged into a child's red wagon and got another drink. Marissa followed two steps behind. Her drink wasn't empty, but she held out the cup for Juliet to fill, her eyes on her hands as she poured the liquor. A drop spilled onto Marissa's finger and when Juliet brushed it away, she felt a jolt at her touch. Marissa sipped from her drink. She hadn't wanted to come to the party, but her roommate had insisted, begged really, claiming that she couldn't go anywhere alone. Marissa hadn't seen her since they'd walked in, her ponytail bobbing as she disappeared into the dark. There aren't a lot of us here, Marissa said, peering into the darkened corner of the room where people clustered together in groups of two or three. Juliet looked around the room. Women? Marissa shook her head. 
minority students. Juliet made herself another drink. I guess that's why we're still in the minority. Marissa drank from her cup. The rum felt hot in her throat. You always talk like that? Like what, Juliet asked. Like you're being interviewed. Marissa, surprised by her own candor, was about to blame the alcohol when Juliet laughed. Sorry, Juliet said, I grew up answering a lot of questions. Why, you famous or something? Juliet looked down at her hands. I could be, if I practice more. She stared at Marissa as if seeing her for the first time. I played the piano since I was young, classical mostly, she paused, jazz if my father isn't listening. Marissa lifted her eyebrows in surprise. You must have a gift. Juliet exhaled. Some people thought I was pretty good. What did you think? Juliet sucked on the ice from her cup. I hated to practice. Sounds like career suicide for a musician, Marissa said, or self-sabotage. It's not like that being a musician, it's not a job. Juliet didn't look at her when she spoke. They watched a couple in front of them dancing too slow for the music, a pop song Marissa recognized but didn't know well enough to sing along. Juliet nodded with the beat, still not looking at her, and Marissa worried she had offended her. But then Juliet said, you sound like a psych major. And Marissa, relieved, smiled in response. She had never been good at small talk, especially at the few high school parties she'd been allowed to attend where they'd watched MTV videos in some kid's furnished basement and ate Pop-Tarts and sipped on blueberry schnapps, wondering what the popular kids were doing. She hoped for more meaningful interactions in college. So far, she hadn't been disappointed. I have two years to figure it out, plenty of time, right? If you don't waste it, Juliet said. I spent my first year pre-med before I realized nothing could make my old man happy. So I switched to music. You followed your heart doesn't sound like a waste to me. It is if I'm ordinary, Juliet said, a flat tone in her voice. Then she dragged the tip of her sneaker across the floor, toy, toe pointed like a ballerina, leaving a scuff mark on the hard wood. Marissa wondered if she was also a dancer. Do you still hate it? Juliet looked at her with a confused expression. The piano? No, silly, practicing. She watched Juliet tilt her head, wearing a look of complete concentration as she chewed on her bottom lip. Marissa, who had never wanted to French kiss anyone before, let alone another girl, began to imagine how Juliet's lips would feel against her mouth. I miss it, Juliet said, smiling to herself. Whenever I go, a day without playing. Her teeth shined brightly in the dark. But sometimes, just to test myself, I won't play for a few days, won't even sit at the piano. Why? Why separate yourself from something you love? Just to see if I can, Juliet said simply. A skinny guy in all black walked by carrying a plate of snacks. Juliet reached to grab a brownie, tossing the whole square into her mouth. Marissa watched the muscles in her jaw contract as she chewed. Then she added, I don't want to need something that much. It's like a fucking addiction. At 18, Marissa wasn't afraid of need, not yet. If anything, she felt intrigued by it, desperate to be held in its clutches. She would have given anything to feel that much desire for something, especially if she was good at it, if it made people notice her. Don't you think, Marissa said, there are healthy addictions? Maybe, but I didn't choose classical piano. My mother played and when she died, Juliet shrugged. My father wanted me to be like her. Call me selfish, but if I'm going to be tethered to something, I'd at least like it to be something I choose. Marissa nodded. She realized it wasn't her business. She didn't know this girl. Why would her opinion matter? But then she found herself saying, it's never too late to choose something else, I mean, not till you're in the ground. Juliet shot her a skeptical look. Marissa felt suddenly hot. She wished they had AC in these old houses, wished Juliet would move closer to the window so she could follow her there. Are you religious? Juliet asked. Marissa wasn't quite sure how to answer. My parents are Catholic, she said. I'm asking about you. Juliet leaned in closer. Do you believe in God? Marissa could feel the warmth of her body, could smell the rum on her breath, and underneath that her perfume, a salty musk scent with a hint of citrus. I think so, Marissa began. I mean, I want to, but I'm not sure it's a good fit. I'm not 
like my parents. Well, that's reassuring, Juliet said, reaching out to tuck a loose curl behind Marissa's ear. Most Catholics don't like me or my kind. Marissa watched as Juliet's lips pulled back into a smile. She saw her start to laugh, but didn't hear the sound as if all her senses had shut down except sight. She looked at her profile, strong nose, high cheekbones, wide almond shaped eyes, struck by the realization that she had never seen such a beautiful face, like something out of a magazine. She memorized the rest of Juliet's body, the baggy white t-shirt, V-neck, probably a man's, the jeans that hung loose off her narrow hips, Levi's, stonewashed blue, the white tipped sneakers etching rubber marks onto the floors, converse, faded, dried, like a red, faded red, like a dried flower. We all have to make our own God, Juliet said. I don't think I could play music if I didn't believe in something outside of myself. Marissa wanted to respond with something smart, something clever and inspiring, but all she could think of was, I like you, I like your kind, which sounded so pathetic in her head that she didn't dare say it out loud. Juliet drew the tip of her sneaker across the floor again, leaving a series of wide white scuff marks. When she was done, Marissa could see that she had drawn a cross, one matched by the gold emblem dangling from a chain around Juliet's neck. Another drink, Juliet asked. And when Marissa nodded, she led her back to the bar reaching through the crowd to grab her hand so they wouldn't get separated. Juliet refilled her, their glasses with vodka, all that was left, topping it with orange juice from a jug on the table. The music shifted to hard rock and soon the dance floor became a mass of bodies thrashing around and knocking into each other. It wasn't a ritual she understood, but Marissa wanted to fit in. Wanna dance? She yelled over the music. Juliet shook her head. My brother's the dancer. She smiled as she leaned into Marissa, walking her backward through the crowd, one fumbling step at a time until they were pressed against the back wall. It was dark, the music was loud, and the force of 50 people, drunk, sweaty, young, swelled around them. To Providence, Juliet said, raising her cup, and Catholics, and to choosing something else, Marissa added, not sure what she meant by it. Juliet winked, and they toasted, bringing their plastic cups together. Before Marissa could take a drink, Juliet kissed her. It wasn't a long or deep kiss, but it was enough for Marissa to register it, to realize that it was happening, her first real kiss, and she felt relief and exhilaration, knowing she had been right about college, this college, and this girl. Marissa fell in love that first night, the tickle in the pit of her belly turned into a grumble, an all out gnawing that would stay with her for months, their first encounter, a subtle indication of what was to come. On the way home from the party, she told her roommate, who spent the night puking margaritas into their wastebasket and didn't remember the conversation in the morning. Marissa never confided in her again. When the crush hadn't subsided a few weeks later, she confessed to her dorm's peer counselor, a woman studies major who didn't believe in monogamy and encouraged her to challenge her heteronormative notions of romantic love. Eventually she wrote to her best friend from high school, now at UConn on a basketball scholarship who only had one piece of advice, don't tell your parents. Marissa followed that advice, but she also never told Juliet, not directly. Instead, she loved Juliet severely and secretly through all four years of college even though she dated other women, had two long-term relationships and had shared only that one kiss on the first night they met. In the weeks that followed, they became friends, nothing more. And Marissa tried to convince herself that friendship was not only enough, it was preferred. Lovers come and go, but friends last. And she desperately wanted more than anything for this relationship to last. She tried to get over her feelings for Juliet, but couldn't. No one else held her interest so completely. No one captivated her as Juliet had done in those first 10 minutes, huddled together in the dark, crowded living room of an old house on Brook Street on a warm September night when she was just 18. Looking back, Marissa realized that was part of the problem. Her love for Juliet 
was old and desperate, set up from that very first moment to disappoint her. Her thirst so great, she thought she could settle for anything, convinced herself that even a sip would be better than nothing, when in fact, a sip would not even wet her lips, let alone satisfy her. Years later, when she did finally get that sip, a few sips really, maybe even a whole glass, it acted instead like a poison, eating away at the very thing that created it. Okay, that's the end of that first scene where they meet. And then I'm gonna jump ahead a couple hundred pages just to give a little bit of another character um, who is actually uh, Juliet's father. And he is a little bit uh, based on my father. For those who knew my father, you may, you may recognize him. Um, he's a imposing larger than life figure and a professor at the university. And throughout the course of the book, he's complicated. He and Juliet have a complicated relationship. They're estranged for time. And he does some fairly suspect things. So when I go to his section, I start with this part and a little bit of it that I'm gonna read for you, which gives um, a little bit more humanity and, and sort of begins to show the, some of the roots of his wound. Um, I was trying to just make him a little bit more likable. Okay, so his name is Winston. If asked how many children Winston has, his first thought is always three. Yet by the time he speaks, he has amended the answer, one living, two dead. When Jasper was alive, he would say two, not mentioning the boy who came in between, the one he held only once and never took home. They named him before Faye went into labor, James Houston after her favorite uncle. And though everything about him was a surprise from his conception while Jasper was still breastfeeding to his shockingly early birth, they considered him a blessing. The pregnancy was normal in every way except its duration. At 33 weeks, and for reasons the doctor could never explain, Faye's water broke and her uterus began to contract ushering their second son into the world on a wet night in April when Jasper was just two years old. There was no way to stop it, so the doctors prepared an incubator and warmed flannel blankets, ordered medicine to help his immature lungs, but it didn't matter. The baby could not breathe on his own. In every other way, he was perfect, 10 fingers and toes, a strong heartbeat, which Winston felt against his fingertips when he touched him for the first time, his hands scrubbed raw with disinfectant and soap. And he noticed the fine features of his mother, including her light brown eyes and a cap of silky dark hair the nurses longed to comb. The following day, at just 23 hours old, after a night in the NICU where the attending doctor had spent his shift manually inflating the ventilator to keep the baby's lungs from collapsing, they turned the machine off and took him out of the incubator to lie in his mother's arms for the first and last time. Winston could not look at the boy. Instead, he focused on his wife, her eyes bloodshot from pushing, her skin blanched with heartache. He held her hand and watched the tears pour from her swollen eyes. She didn't wipe her face clean and neither did he. He was afraid to touch her. The baby lay perfectly still, like he was dead already, but they both knew he wasn't, not yet. She didn't rock him, but there was a sway to her embrace, her mother's instinct wanting to comfort him, soothe him, even though he showed no signs of distress. He seemed to be sleeping, dreaming even, as his eyeballs twitched under the delicate skin of his eyelids, a smooth and shiny silk. The nurse cleared the room, telling them to take their time, there is not enough time, Winston thought, to say goodbye to a life not yet begun. Words left him as he tried to think of a prayer to recite on behalf of his little boy, a song to sing for the angels come early to take him home. Later, standing at the gravesite beside the small cabin, the coffin, he had the Bible to turn to, and he recited three psalms to the small group, 
his voice clear and strong. But here in the hospital room, he had no such armor. The assault of grief wiped his mind clean. Winston closed his eyes, blinking back tears, and made the sign of the cross. Faye lay motionless in the hospital bed, the baby tucked beside her. He was swaddled in a thin white blanket, arms at his sides. They both looked like dolls. Faye leaned over to kiss him, first his eyelids, then his closed mouth, lips pressed together, as if they were still forming, the edges not yet unfurled, like petals of a flower waiting to bloom. Winston barely recognized his wife, her face a mask of sorrow. Please, Faye said, her voice just above a whisper. She looked towards the window, and Winston knew what she wanted. He glanced down at the hospital bed. The sheets were thin and bone white, stiff with the smell of bleach. A dark stain spread from between her legs. You're bleeding, Winston said. Faye shook her head as if it didn't matter. Help me, she said. He took the baby from her as she struggled to get up from the bed. The three of them walked together to the window and looked out at the darkening night. City lights blinked on in the distance like stars filling up the sky. Faye took the baby into her arms, leaving Winston with a strange emptiness. The feeling of his son's body, its specific warmth had already left him, evaporating into memory. And he marveled at the boy's weightlessness, a bird removed from his hands. He forced himself to memorize the features of his son's still forming face, every line and curve, counting each of the long black eyelashes and tracing the pattern of damp brown curls with his finger. Winston felt something slipping away, some knowledge or instinct he was certain he would need to withstand these next moments, something invaluable to their survival, yet he could do nothing to keep it. He wanted to stop everything, all the clocks ticking off time they no longer had, the beep and whir of machines tracking progress, the echo of footsteps on the polished linoleum of the hallway, all the sounds of life moving on around him. He wanted to freeze everything exactly as it was, destroy it if he had to, just so they had something recognizable to hold on to. Yet all he could do was stand there and wait. The room was cold and goosebumps erupted over his skin. Outside, the flashing lights of an ambulance. He listened for the sound of the siren, but heard nothing. Faye made a noise, a horrible choking gasp, then fell against him, her body a dead weight that almost knocked him over. He caught her roughly, his unconscious wife, and the now dead baby she clutched fiercely in her arms and lowered them awkwardly to the ground. Winston imagined what he would say to young Jasper, what he could say to anyone as he reached for the nurse's call button and waited on the cold, hard floor to be found. All right, I'm just gonna end there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was wonderful. Thank you for that great reading. And now I'm going to introduce Jill Bielowski. She is the author of six acclaimed collections of poetry, three critically acclaimed novels, and two memoirs, including History of a Suicide, My Sister's Unfinished Life, a New York Times bestseller. Her poems and essays have appeared in the Best American Poetry, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Harper's O, The Kenyon Review, Harvard Review, and The Paris Review, among others. She is executive editor and vice president at W.W. Norton. Her work has been a finalist for the James Laughlin Award, the Patterson Poetry Prize, and the Books for a Better Life Awards. In 2014, she was honored by the Poetry Society of America for her distinguished contribution to poetry. She lives in New York City. The Deceptions is an explosive tale of art and myth, desire and betrayal from New York Times bestselling author. 
It was just included as part of the millions most anticipated in the great second half 2022 book preview. And some background about the book. Something terrible has happened and I don't know what to do. An unnamed narrator's life is unraveling. Her only child has left home. Her 20 year marriage is strained. Anticipation about her soon to be released book of poetry looms. She seeks answers to the paradoxes of love, desire, and parenthood among the Greek and Roman gods at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. As she passes her days teaching at a boys prep school, spending her off hours sequestered in the museum's austere galleries, she is haunted by memories of a year long friendship with a colleague, a fellow poet struggling with his craft. As secret betrayals and deceptions come to light and rage threatens to overwhelm her, the pantheon of gods assume remarkably vivid lives of their own, forcing her to choose between reality and myth in an effort to free herself from the patriarchal constraints of the past and embrace a new vision for her future. Here's one of my favorite quotes from the book. The Iliad and the Odyssey, the two greatest poems of ancient Greece, inspired me and fueled my love's my love for books at an early age. Who would I be without poetry? Books saved me. Reading on a bench in one of the changing rooms of the dress shop in Hoboken, where my mother worked when she wasn't at home, making decoupage boxes she sold at craft fairs. Reading in those changing rooms, crammed with undesired dresses hanging on racks, I understood the characters in novels Extremes of emotion in poems are more engaging and profound than life itself. How to explain that the imagination flourishes under the poverty and synthetic smell of retail in a secret chamber of a dress shop? How can I expect my husband to understand that I'm a captive? Writing is like a dream. You have to stay inside it. But this I cannot say for fear he'll think me self-serving. I quail with my defiance. My anger roils inside me. Please help me welcome Jill Bielowski. Oh, um, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for such a, um, a lovely introduction and for um, for giving the reader such a wonderful um, entree into the, into the book. I'm so happy to be reading at um, the Hudson Valley, um, really just such an important organization for poetry and prose. And um, it was lovely to hear Rachel read her engrossing, uh, from her engrossing novel. So I'm gonna, um, I'm just going to read um, two sections. The first section is, as um, Jennifer said, my character is um, when the novel opens and I, I see the novel as kind of a, a, fable, a fable or a fever dream. She, she's really in this um, state because um, her son has just left home for college, um, which has left an emptiness and she's having to um, She's in a, a crisis. She's in a crisis with her marriage. She's in a crisis because something terrible has happened and she doesn't know what to do, which is something that echoes throughout the book. And this is the section um, where she's in conversation with her next door neighbor. And her neighbor is like her, her um, doppelganger. Um, uh, in a sense, they're almost two sides of a self. The minute I'm out the door, turning the key in the lock, I see my neighbor on the stairs, taking out the trash in a shopping bag from Bergdorf's. It's too late to avoid her. I put on my sunglasses so she can't see my puppy eyes. Where are you going so early, she says. I don't want to tell her where I'm going, but I don't know what else to say. I'm going to the museum, the Met, I say. Really? So early, she responds. 
Is there a specific exhibit you want to see? What gallery do you like the best, she says, and she goes on with her questions. It is where I go to be alone, to think and restore, but I don't say it. My mother brought me to the museum every Christmas when I was a girl. Each time we explored one specific gallery, it got so I knew which gallery to go in a particular mood when I was on my own, lonely to the impressionist wing. I'd imagine myself in a Bonnard courtyard or bathing on the grass in a painting by Seurat. When I longed for love, those statues of Rodin's lovers, yearning for a child off to view the Renoir or Degas portraits of young girls and Mary Cassatt's young mother sewing. The temple of Dendur was where I went to mourn my babies. Sometimes in my greed, I believe it belongs only to me. My first kiss was in front of the Jackson Pollock painting that takes up an entire wall. I can't go into that gallery without thinking about it. Someone, maybe it was me, said one's first love is the key to the heart, but that is another story. To honor the tradition, I took my son to the museum when he was little. He loved the shining nights, the Egyptian tombs and the temple. My husband had the gym and the track with him. I had the museum. Beauty, it is dangerous, it consumes, it perpetuates, it leads us to desire, reveals our darkest emotions. I took my son to the museum when he was against my chest in a snuggly and the top of his head hit my chin. I could simply tilt my head down and kiss him at will. People used to stop me to marvel at his long eyelashes and dark hair with a violet ring around his crown when the light hit it. I brought, him, I brought him when he was interested in touching all the objects and he was not allowed to touch them and we learned this lesson. Then I brought him to the temple of Dendur when he was learning about the Egyptians and was required to write a report for school on mummies. To celebrate my birthday, we'd always end our time at the temple strolling around the walls until eventually he felt free enough to tell me about Olivia, his girlfriend, or the first time he smoked weed. The only way I can get him to tell me about personal stuff is when he doesn't think he wants to talk about it. I've long deemed the museum my second home, but I don't want to tell my neighbor. Can you sit for a sec, she asks. Her eyes are red. She clings to my arm. I can see the strap from a thin negligee under her silk Japanese robe. On the cold marble stairwell steps, she locks her arm in mine and tears puddle in her eyes. What's wrong, I say. Her body is warm. I feel her tentacles attaching to me like a prickly burr, but I don't know much. I don't know how much I can take, she says. The bloke has no time for me. Marriage is not for the faint hearted, I say, and shake my head in consolation, in conciliation. My son always liked her Aussie accent. He had a crush on her as a little kid, liking how she fawned over him, asked him questions, flirted with him like she does with everyone. At times I wished I was more like her, not so tightly wound, protected. My son adored her twins when they were little, a girl and a boy two years older than he is. They were so sweet with him, though sometimes her son would get angry if my son beat him in a game and he'd send him home and he would sulk until I could distract him. He should have been a twin too. He was, he is, but our daughter, his twin, died shortly after birth. His sister's now only a ghost. Once I caught my neighbor's daughter brushing my son's hair while she sat very still. Over the years, I became close with my neighbor's daughter. She's introverted, awkward, a reader, the brightest in her class at Emily Dickinson, my son's sister school. She was valedictorian when she graduated. She read my poetry, came to my readings, and we discussed literature together, books we both were reading when she was in high school. My neighbor worried that she shut herself in a room too much. She complained her daughter was critical of her. My neighbor wanted her to be more social worried that she rarely went out or she kept herself apart when my son came over to play. 
I long for those days when my neighbor and I lounged on her Italian velvet couch, drinking Chardonnay while our boys trashed her apartment, which was three times the size of mine. My neighbor has a good eye and great taste. She was an art history major in college. It puzzles me that she doesn't take herself more seriously. I like my, my neighbor's husband, but I don't like how he treats my neighbor. It's, it, it's as if he's harboring anger that has nothing to do with her. I see this sometimes in people who are unexamined. Of course, all of us are capable of self-delusions, even when we think we know ourselves. He's pale with hair the color of a Turkish apricot, rosy cheeks, tall and fit, wears large black frame glasses, possesses a cutting sense of humor, content to eat his crisps, crisps or watch telly and read his book, or so I'm told by my neighbor. I, can, I am not privy to his internal life. He dislikes the word, work he does, complains it's too stressful, says he plans to retire early, He's a selfish prick, my neighbor continues, always thinking about himself first. I'm sorry, I say, and shake my head. Can you believe it? He's planned a hunting trip with chaps from work on our anniversary weekend. He didn't remember. I had to buy my own engagement ring, she says. He didn't have time to pick it out. I look at the light catching on the yellow stone, the size of a dollop of fresh cream in a cup of coffee. I automatically bring my thumb to my ring finger, searching for my, for my ruby engagement ring, but there's only the thin wedding band. I shouldn't complain. He's not like those cheap kangaroos loose in the paddock I once dated, but I can't help it. He drives me crazy. Do you know what he said to me? That he needs to be serviced. This is what I'm living with, she says. Did he really say it that way, I ask? It's what he meant, she says, and rolls her eyes. My husband and I call them the odd couple. She's extroverted and he's mostly unsociable and withdrawn. On occasion, we enjoy their company, but she has the habit as soon as we sit down for a meal to bombard us with questions. What do we do on the weekend? What movies have we seen? Where are we going on holiday? I'm stunned into silence. Listening to her chat, about where they've been, the people they've seen. I'm reminded I don't have much of a social life. There's so little time with teaching, writing, my family, that this is not something I'm willing to disclose to my neighbor. My husband likes her husband's cutting sense of humor, and they enjoy talking about sports. He has affection for my neighbor too, but behind her back calls her a chatterbox and wonders how her husband puts up with it. I remind him that it's impossible to know what goes on between two couples behind closed doors. Since our children left for ch college, we don't have as much in common and see them less. I have to go, I say. I'm sorry you're so upset. Do you think it's just a bad period, you know, a lapse? I don't know, she says, it feels different. She squeezes my hand and thanks me for listening. You're the only person I can trust. I recoil. I do not want to be that person. Even in her anxious state, my neighbor's hair falls to her shoulders in soft waves saturated with sunlit highlights. Her nails are painted black, too dark for this hour of the morning. My head aches. I smell the scent of her musky cologne. It makes my stomach lurch. I don't want to tell her that something has happened that I can't undo, that she's not alone. I pick up my bag from the step. The weight is so heavy with one or two books I always carry with me, my notebook and iPad, forever concerned that I want, might want to make notes on something I'm working on or have something to read on the bus. I can barely get it over my shoulder. And then I hear him, her husband, through her half open door. Is the missus going to make breakfast, he calls. The missus, she has a name. I shake my head and cringe. He hasn't yet discovered that the patriarchy has failed, that money isn't enough to please his wife, that he can't lock himself off with his books and sports, 
that relationships are malleable and need attention. And now I'm going to skip over to a, another um, small section. Um, and this section is about my, na uh, my character um, uh, who's mourning her, her um, more youthful life as a young poet. And then suddenly I remember riding through the park on the bus when I first moved to New York. Sunday mornings, eager, e eager to escape my roommate with the sounds of wake up sex through our thin walls. The museum was my church, that seedy SRO, SRO with its damp and germ infested brown carpet. I never took off my socks. The mini fridge that hummed all night, the Zigfield Follies ladies with blue or purple hair who sat in the lobby all day as if waiting for an audition from the underworld. I met my roommate in grad school. She was more adventurous. She'd sleuth out the parties and drag me along. We'd inevitably run into Ruth and Mark Shep Ruth Marvin and Mark Shepard, who never remembered our names. Both had MF MFAs from Columbia and already had their first books taken. Their epic fights as if timed sucked all the air out of the room, and later in the night, they'd be on top of each other making out. I met Jules Sachs at one of those parties. Even with his pockmarked face, he was weirdly attractive, a scholar of German translating Ingeborg Bachmann. We slept together a few times, and then it railed off. My roommate and I scavenged the basement vintage store on the corner of Columbus Avenue and 80th Street searching for faux fur jackets and sexy party dresses. She'd do this little shimmy in the mirror. On Saturdays, we went to see the latest foreign film at Film Forum and rode the subway to the East Village for cheap chicken tikka and paradas in Little India near St. Mark's Place. Afterward, we'd venture to the St. Mark's bookshop and browse lit quarterlies. The first time I had a poem published in the Paris Review, we celebrated at Finelli's on Prince Street, clicking glasses of Prosecco. Her manuscript was a finalist for the National Poetry Series. It didn't win and she wouldn't leave her bed all weekend. Yes, we were jealous of each other. When one of us got a poem accepted or wrote something so stunning, we wished we'd written it, but were also attached to each other and close. And we laugh together, sometimes about how pathetic we were, two lonely poets trying to sort out a life in the big city. I suppose I was jealous of her less inhibited nature and felt lonely when she didn't come home some nights. And I think she was jealous of me too. She always said I had a focus she lacked. Of course, she had more frequent boyfriends than I did and I was envious of how she could open herself to men. She mooned over a Puerto Rican poet who performed at the New Eurekan Poets Cafe. Then it was a new formalist, but as far as I could tell, he was a young Republican who wrote an erotic villanelle that we figured out after he dumped her was about me. I'm skipping over some parts here. Well, we're still in touch, but we only see each other maybe once or twice a year. On occasion, we still trade poems and help each other edit them, but it's less frequent. Sometimes I wonder why I never pursued getting a professorship at a university once my first book was published. By then I was married and we had settled in New York City and there were a few appointments in, available in such a competitive teaching market. At least that is what I told myself. But now I think it's because change frightens me it always has, and I love teaching the boys at the academy, even when they disappoint me or get on my nerves. My imagined future on days like today, it cries hot in my ear. I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jill. That was wonderful. It's so great to have both of you here with us tonight. And um, I thought we could start the Q&A by having you ask each other a question about your work and your writing process. 
Okay, let me jump in. Jill, that was such a great reading. Thank you so much. Um, and I mean, when I listen to your bio, I can't even believe it. I mean, I don't, I just want to start with how do you possibly juggle editing and so many other people's work and, and you know, their manuscripts in your mind and your own work? How do you find that balance? I mean, how do you find the time? Yeah, well, <laughs> Rachel, um, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote this essay re recently for, for Catapult about this very thing. And, um, and, and what I said was that I really kind of write in the secret crevices and um, corners of my life. Um, typically, I, I do get up um, when I'm working on a project, I do get up early in the morning before I go to work. And that for me is the best time to write because I'm still, you know, still not quite awake yet. And, mm -hmm. and the, you know, how it is, the responsibilities of life have not crowded in yet. Um, yeah, I have a weird process. I also kind of tunnel in on the weekends and even on vacations, I sometimes go to like a hotel for a, a week to try to um, work on a draft. So it's it's a little scattershot, but it works for me in, in its own strange way because I don't know if you are like this, but I sort of always think about whatever I'm working on is like, it's like a secret. And um, that kind of urgency and secrecy about it sort of works for me in this strange way. It creates a kind of urgency, um, mm. you know, when I don't have a full day to, to work on my, my writing. Um, so yes, it is a balancing act, but after many, many years, I, I've really come to rely on this strange practice of mine. <laughs> I'm curious, how, how, how does that work for you? Um, what is your writing I mean, practice? Yeah, it's similar, you know, especially when my kids were really young. Um, I did that that same thing of, of waking up before the house uh, was what I would always say. And, you know, that was usually around five just to give myself, you know, like a good, you know, hour and a half, two hours before I belonged to anyone else, you know, before I checked emails and sort of got in the world. And same with the teaching. You know, a lot of times people ask me, like, how do you balance the, the teaching and the writing? And it's the same thing because it's like a different you know, part of my, my mind and even my own work. Like I don't edit first thing in the morning. I usually do the writing and, and really like that fresh, like you're saying, when you're part asleep, it's like the, the dreamscape, you know, allows a different fluency. Um, and I like what you're saying about the, the secret. It's almost, it's almost like you're having an affair, you know, when you go with your, you know, characters. I mean, that's how I feel too. And I don't talk a lot about it when I'm, writing, you know, I don't talk, even my wife doesn't know what I'm writing, you know, so it's like, I, I'm just, I want to peek in, I want to see it, I want to touch it. Um, and then, you know, and then I kind of go back to my regular life too. Um, and it, it's hard, you know, it can definitely be hard. And I'm, a lot of writers, I think are more introverted, I'm more of an extrovert. Um, and so I, I, you know, I need to be alone to do my work, but I, also need to kind of get out there and, and talk to people and I feel energized. So I have to have that balance so that I'm, you know, making sure my butt is at home in the chair enough and, and then sort of going out into the right. world and bringing that energy in and putting it into the, into the pages. Yes, I, I feel the same way. Absolutely. Um, there is, I, I also feel very energized by my work as an editor. You know, so that, um, you know, it's, it's just really an interesting balance because writing is so, as you say, you know, I mean, it's solitary, it's intense, it's, um, uh, you know, it's a secret. I also don't show my work to, to my husband. Um, and I rarely talk about it with friends. I feel like if I do, it's going to float away somehow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or I won't be able to, to grasp it again. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the um, how you came to, what was your 
trigger for this novel. Um, it, ju it just, it, it has so many layers to it, Rachel, um, with the different relationships that I heard as you read. And I do have a yeah. copy of it. I just haven't been able to tackle it yet. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. It was a lot of things. And like, like Jennifer mentioned in the quote, you know, something I'd said at an earlier um, event, you know, I, I had started working on it, you know, years ago before, like in my mind, before I put, you know, pen to paper um, and, and created any kind of document that I, you know, considered the, the draft. Um, and it was from a couple different personal things in my life, you know, a couple different um, losses and, and sort of wounds in relationships. Um, and some that, you know, I witnessed as well, which I often take, not as mine, but, but if I'm close enough to someone and I sort of understand the emotional landscape of something that they might've experienced, and I feel, you know, I can add it as another layer to what I'm writing about. And so, I was really interested in a couple different things that are in the book. I was interested in fathers and daughters. You know, there's like a doubling of two women and their relationships with their fathers. Um, you know, I had a strong father and a strong relationship with him. And it was really, you know, um, you know, foundational beyond just parenting, but because of both being writers and, and sort of looking up to him in that way. Um, and so that was really something I wanted to examine and I wanted to examine um, a sibling relationship because there's like a brother sister um, relationship happening in the book and then the cent what what is sort of marketed as the central idea of of the two moms and and raising the the boy and um, you know I am a mother and I have raised children and had children in in a couple different ways you know I've been the mother I'm biological mother I've been the other mother um, I've been a stepmom and am a stepmom. And so again, I was just very interested as I grew up and evolved and kind of like went through this in my personal life, I was realizing like, you know, if I, there was, there was wonderful things and sort of an abundance, um, and also like losses with that, with divorce, with blending a, a new family. And I was like, if I can pull that into something meaningful for my work, it'll be really valuable. Um, and I ended up sort of weaving it all together uh, in this one book and really because of the structure, otherwise it would have been overwhelming. But to me, it was like, oh, if I take it kind of one person at a time, you know, give some of the backstory, have some of the secrets that we talked about within our own writing, um, what draws us, you know, I, I feel the same about the work. I always, I like planting secrets um, in, in uh, sort of the fictional world which someone's covering up. It's like, you know, someone's revealing. Um, it just adds like a lot of tension. And then this one, I put in a more time that I've ever worked with before, which is a new element, you know, um, like the, the scene I read where they're like, they're going back to being 18, then they're in their forties later, you know, you meet, mm -hmm. you see them in their twenties, you know, and there's a, there's a big span. And again, that's part of why I worked on it so long. Cause it was like, I had these ideas very early on where I hadn't lived enough life and I it was like working on my first novel and it was kind of like oh I don't know if I can juggle all that let me keep living let me try to survive this and then see if I can turn it into something um and so that's you know sort of how you know people always ask so how you're working on it so long I mean it was on and off you know and and when my father passed away I was grieving and then like I put the book down for like a year because um it was just close it was just hard to to look at this these scenes i had imagined and um this character that was very much his own and, and fictionalized person not my father but just that emotional terrain being um similar and in that initial grieving period it was very hard um but i think i'm better for it the book is better for it so it's one of those things i always tell my students you know let it take the time it takes um and it will evolve and you will evolve um, and, and be ready for what it presents, you know, what you're presented with in, in terms of looking at the story and looking at yourself, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, um, I try to tell my authors that as well. There's no reason to rush through a novel. I too um, do a lot of layering um, over a pretty long period of time that my novel, um, The Deceptions, I think was a five or six year period 
that I was working on it on on and off. Um, yeah. And what type of outlining do you do? Like, are you one of those writers who's like very clear about what what it is before you go into it, or are you able to kind of let the story unfold? And and are you open to like discovering things as you go along? Yeah. Yeah, I'm more the latter. Um, the, my, the deception sort of started um, actually, um, I was in a, I was really grieving when my only son went away to college and I felt, um, you know, really in this kind of identity crisis that I had you know, I had been juggling so much in my life about, you know, um, you know, being a mother, a wife, an editor, a writer, and then suddenly this big part disappeared. And that was kind of the beginning of the novel for me. And then I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, into the Greek and Roman rooms and um, for some reason, and I, and I have been in those rooms before, but for some reason, um, you know, this, these, these um, sculptures and statues and artifacts of Roman and Greek societies and these kind of patriarchal structures kind of came alive for me. Um, and I decided that I I would have my central character be a teacher at an all boys school because I also wanted to explore in this book ideas of um, you know agency as a poet and um, and power and how one finds one's agency and then kind of the Me Too movement unfolded and I somehow began to channel my own anger that I wasn't even aware that I was so angry. <laughs> and so I allowed um, this voice to really unfold um, in, in kind of this crazy fever dream that happens to her. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I didn't have a plan at all. But as years ago, a, a writing teacher told me that when you're working on a novel, the most important Thing is to make sure that you have a job for your character. And once I decided she was going to be a poet and a teacher at an all boys school, it started clicking into place. Mm. And then the Greek and Roman mm. gods and goddesses, I began taking pictures on my iPhone when I was at the museum. And somehow these myths come into play in, in the narrative of this novel. Um, so yeah, it, I'm the, for me, sort of the characters start telling you what to do and where to go. And I find that really um, scary, um, yeah. not to actually know exactly where it's going, but um, it's always served me well. Um, also in poetry, not to know where a poem is going, you know, that one idea, springs forth something else, something unexpected. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, I see that. we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, okay, are we supposed to be looking at those? Yeah, we have some questions in the I chat, know. but I would just okay. like to ask, since you brought up, Jill, about poetry, um, and I know that Rachel uh -huh. has written poetry and, and short stories. Um, how do you navigate the different terrains when you when you write in a different genre? How is it similar for you? How is it different for you? And why um, do you do you do both? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I started out writing as a poet, and I I I feel that that served me really well because. Um, you know, with poetry, you really have to um, understand craft and the use of metaphor and, and also um, devices, you know, enjambment and repetition and, um, uh, you know, there's, and just kind of the music of language. And so I started out as a poet and I, I felt like that 
craft has really helped me with my fiction and nonfiction in some ways. Um, it usually like, um, I'm usually writing to try to figure out something that I don't know yet and that I wanna go on a journey with. Poetry, I think, is very different from fiction, at least for me. Um, I think poetry is a more um, internal art for me, a more, um, in some ways, personal art. Um, although one hopes that, that one's experience gets transformed. And of course, that is the same in fiction. But with fiction, you're dealing with characters and plot which took me a long time to understand how, how plot and point of view work. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to explain it, but I, I feel the impulses of, of poetry all the time. And I, I write poems and I just put them in a folder and go back to them and go back to them. And, um, and with fiction, I feel that I feel like I could sustain. Um, I, I love playing with characters and developing characters. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you really are creating your own world. And I feel sad when it's all over. I, I actually miss them. <laughs> Do you feel yeah, that Yeah, me way, too. Rachel? Totally. I yeah, miss, I, I miss spending so time with too. them and yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, it's a little weird, you know, probably to other people, but to me, it's I, totally, it's like they're, you know, when I'm in that final stretch, I'm like craving to be with them in the way that you would, you know, uh, a person that you love to spend time with, you know, and, and especially like when you are writing in such a way that you're discovering things about them and you're allowing them to kind of tell you things about who they are and what needs to happen. So then you can be surprised by your own characters and, and stuff. So it is, it's like an intriguing practice to, to go and to write. It's not just, um, you know, spitting out something that you think, you know, I mean, I feel the same way. I think a lot of times I'm writing to try to figure something out, to try to, um, you know, figure out how I feel or what happened or, um, you know, sort of understand something about people by setting these other characters that I can manipulate a bit more obviously than, than people in my real life. Um, and with poetry, I don't write that much. I, I find it so hard. You know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for poets. Um, I was raised by a poet. I grew up in poetry readings. Um, so I'm very comfortable around poets. That, Michael Harper, your father? Yes, yes, he was my father. And um, yeah, what a, what a incredible yeah I mean, you know, he was just a force. Um, and, and there were so many writers of all types around the house growing up. And, and, you know, I was just so fortunate to kind of be in their midst. And so I find, um, I find poetry for me, it's almost uh, perhaps like a very religious person feels about certain texts. You know, I go to poetry. Um, I had to recite poetry as a kid instead of like prayers. And I have poems in my mind, other people's work, you know, and I read poetry before I write and, you know, just to kind of get into a sort of sublime state of, of being. And I, I have such, you know, tremendous respect for it that for me, it takes a lot for me to kind of sit down and write a poem, but it will always come from an inspiration of feeling usually um, and sort of phrases might just be existing in the mind. And it, for me, it, it's not, it's, it's difficult, but it's not fraught in a way that fiction sometimes or other dramatic writing I've done, it's, it's more fraught because I'm, I'm really trying to figure something out or I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, trying to s smooth out something that feels rough in terms of, um, you know, connections between people and, and, and often trying to, to rewrite something like re rewrite, you know, different endings or new endings for people. Um, because a lot of times I'm writing about loss, but then I'm always wanting to write a, a new, a sort of a hope after loss. And a lot of times I'm writing about like family configurations and, and new types of families being formed after 
um, an event of, of loss or tragedy um, as kind of like a hopeful way forward. And so that the work of that, um, and I need a lot of time, you know, I need space, I need pages. I mean, this book is way longer than I thought it would be. I didn't want to write such a long book. Whereas in poetry, the economy, you know, I'm just so awed by, and I, I, I wish I could do it all in a couple stanzas, you know, um, and occasionally I have been able to, but, but now the older I get too, the more I feel like I need time and, and space. And that's why I have such admiration for people that can, can um, give us these, you know, condensed uh, and compressed and deeply, you know, emotional um, images and ideas. And, and, and that's why I think it's, I, I, for me, it's one of the best art forms really is poetry. And I, I wish it didn't have, I wish people like loved it and was always reading and talking about it. And it was part of our education system more because I feel that um, we, we need it, you know, as a, as a world, as a community, as, as you know, a nation. Yes, I agree. There's a um, purity to poetry that, that um, you don't see in, in other art forms. Exactly. Yeah, it's like it really can get at what's essential uh, in a beautiful way. So, do we have other questions, we, Jennifer? We do. Um, Moira Trachtenberg asked there are doubles in both books. Do you think we all have alternate paths that we can't help wondering about? And in the case of surviving a twin or a sibling or even yourself, is there a feeling of added weight for that life that could not be lived? Interesting question. Yeah, that is a, that is interesting. I, I'll um, in in um, in my book there are some doubles. Um, as I said, um, at one point um, it, when I was working on the deceptions, and the, the neighbor um, has a part in the book as it goes along. Um, I almost decided that um, that she would be made up, that she's kind of a vehicle for my, I use her as a vehicle for my protagonist to think about her own marriage and her own life. Um, and because they're very different and, and, and yet they're in a similar crisis. And then um, the twinning of, you know, um, having um, my character having twins and one being um, one having died slowly after birth. So when I gave a reading um, in Cleveland, where I'm from, one person in the audience had, had was you know stunned me by saying that she had read all my novels and that in each one there was there were, was a twin that was lost. So that kind of <laughs> really freaked me out because um, I hadn't realized that and she was right. So, you know, subconsciously, I, I, I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Um, but, um, you know, I think that the idea, of course, is of, of loss, you know, that my narrator in the in the novel um, has suffered a loss and um you mentioned that rachel too about loss in your work and you know i've had a number of losses in my life um and that's just always there it always seems to rear its head in some way that i need to go there again so that's how I would answer the question. Not not the best answer, but an intriguing question for me to think more about. Uh, thank you, Maura. Yeah, I feel like I need to think more about that too. I mean, I I feel like in my in this book, you know, there's there's the doubling of of roles, you know, um, and the way I've structured it, it's like there, you know, there are two moms and there are two grandfathers um you know that we get to, to to meet and two sons um and you know a lot of more sort of and i think of it as like the 
as maybe the, you know, they're, they're not mirroring each other, but, but the roles are designed to mirror each other. Therefore, I'm interested in, in being like tilted off that and how they're, how they're similar, but different, all of those roles um, and all of the, the way that people work in our lives um, in terms of the expectation of, of what this role is going to be and what that job of that person is going to be in your life and then how that can shift and how you can try again and how when it seems like it goes wrong, you know, some of the relationships end because there's a death, but but the main one in terms of Jenry and the moms, there's this opportunity to, to start it again. And then he has to figure out well, what would that mean to have two mothers um, for him after after not knowing that's how he was intended to sort of come into the world and, and came into being. And is there space for the other one? And what does that look like? And how can they play different roles? Um, and so that was something I was conscious of examining, but I do think there are probably other things that on the subconscious level um, of, of doubling things that I haven't been aware of, um, but that's something I'll continue to look at because I, I do find it interesting just sort of in life and, and in my own work, I thought of it structurally as kind of echoes where you've got the one book is the mother, then the other mother, you know, the grandfather, the other grandfather, yeah. the son, the other son. Yeah. So I was thinking of it in that way, but I'm sure there are others woven in. So I, I do think I appreciate that question. Thank you for those answers. Another question we got in the chat is what suggestions might you have for a poet interested in writing a novel? Good luck. <laughs> no. no, I'm kidding. Um, you know, I, I don't know. What I would say, I think, um, is that if you have a story to tell, then you probably have a novel in there. I mean, I remember with my first novel, um, I was at... Um, I was in graduate school as a poet at um, the University of Iowa, the writer's workshop there. And um, I read a lot of fiction when I was there. And um, I read for the first time, Marilyn Robinson's novel, Housekeeping, which was just such an incredible novel. And that novel, when I read it, I realized that I had a story that I wanted to tell in fiction. And then I had to figure out how to write, you know, how to learn the craft of fiction. So I think that my advice would be, yes, if you have a story to tell, um, many first novels come out of some kind of autobiographical just, um, way as we've been talking about, about um, fiction and poetry being a way in which one tries to understand something. And to me, I would say that those are kind of the three things that drive a novel is you have a story you want to tell, you have characters that intrigue you, or you're gonna build characters that intrigue you. And then you have an argument or some kind of question that's driving the novel forward. Um, that would be my answer. And, and also taking workshops on the practical level could be very useful. I, I, had, I never took a fiction writing workshop, but um, in retrospect, I think it might have saved me some years yeah, I agree. The workshop thing could be great. And, and obviously just, you know, reading, like I would say to anyone about reading as much as you can and read different types of things and anything that's moving to you. Cause obviously if you're already a poet, you know, and you can, you can work with language and um, you know, that lyricism of, of poetry. So, so making that shift to prose to me is, is, is probably not challenge, but in terms of reading enough books and sort of having those models in your mind of, different ways to tell stories and and what the novel can accomplish and why you want to do that and then it seems like it's more about uh you know the, figuring out the practice of getting it done and writing something longer but it's just the building blocks it's the same it's like stanza on upon stanza and for us you know it's chapter upon chapter um but i remember that before i wrote a novel it was kind of like 
how do people do it? How could I possibly sustain a narrative for like two or 300 pages? It was just like, you know, the longest like paper I'd ever written was like 25 pages or something. It was just like, that just seemed like, you know, crazy. And, and a friend of mine, you know, who had written a novel was just kind of like, you know, chapter one chapter at a time, kind of like, you know, the, the famous bird by bird, um, you know, and it, and it, it works, you know, I mean, it sounds sort of trite, but it really, it really works just as you're getting comfortable and just, just trying to imagine the scope of a, of a story and what it will take to, to sustain something that long. Um, and so, yeah, I think workshops and getting that kind of support could help as well. I would also echo um, what Rachel, what you're saying about reading, because I think that um, there's a certain way of reading as a writer, you know, when you're um, reading novels, I often read them to, to also try to understand what the, what the writer did in, in how the book was crafted and how it worked, whether it was voice driven or interesting points of view, novels that have interesting points of view. Um, so I agree that reading is key. It was key for me. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for those answers. I guess we have time for one more question. Um, Cindy Beerfilly wanted to know how you choose which narrative voice to use, um, first person or omniscient narrator. And do you know from the start or do you try several approaches? Um, that's interesting. You know, I think for, for this novel, once I knew I wanted multiple narrators, then it, it was a question of whether I was going to do first or third. And I had a more experience doing first person and I wanted to really challenge myself. After my last two novels, you know, my first novel was a, sort of a traditional coming of age story. It was first person. Um, and that was it. And then the second novel had multiple narrators, but they were each first person and they were much shorter sections, um, more like Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, where you're just moving fairly quickly. And in this one, I was like, I want more time with each one. So I came up with this idea of the books. But then I did want to challenge myself and I wanted to see if I could do third person in an intimate way. And I didn't wanted to be omniscient because I didn't want that all knowing character um, that sort of, you know, the narrator that knows everyone, everything because I was keeping these secrets and, and wanted things to be revealed in the right time. But I also wanted the intimacy at first. And I've sort of fallen in love later in my life with third person and, and, and how you can choose to be, be far further back um, and sort of like looking like sort of like a camera lens, you know, like a wide angle looking, and then you can really come and zoom in um, and have it feel as intimate as first. Um, and so I played around with that. And, and to me, it just felt like a natural, it just fit for, for this one. Um, and a lot, a couple of my colleagues had noticed, they're like, oh, this is like the first thing when they were hearing me read, like over the years at, at university, I teach like listening to years of me reading the first person narrators. And they're like, this is different. And you know, and um, I wasn't always comfortable with it, but I felt like it served the story. And that to me is an, another important thing to, to try to distinguish as a writer, like when you're serving the story and when it's just something you want to do or like you like it or you think it's easy. And it's like, that's often part of the, you know, process of sort of like getting distance on your own work. And maybe the revision process is, is realizing it's not just about what you want to do, it's what's actually going to serve the story best and the characters best. And sometimes you end up doing things that aren't as comfortable for you, but they, they sort of work better. Um, and, you know, that's, that's my experience. Yes, I think my experience is, is um, well, in, with the deceptions, um, this was the first novel that I wrote in first person. And, um, and I think that that I found the voice in, in the first person, um, using the first person. And I have to say that it, I also think it's a, I didn't know if I could sustain it. 
um, because you know you're always just in one character's head and then you have to figure out how to make the other characters come alive through just one person's perspective. And so I found that very challenging, but also um, refreshing to, to write in the first person. And, um, you know, even in poetry, sometimes when I'm stuck with a poem, I might decide to change the point of view and that can unlock something. So, um, yeah, and with my first novel, I remember I tried it um, from the point of view of a young girl and it was in first person and it just didn't work at all because I was so trapped and, you know, it was like, I don't know how Henry James pulled that off in that novel, What Macy Knew. I think that's first person from a, maybe it's not. Anyways, um, I ended up with, with my first novel, House Under Snow, that I changed from that first person child's voice to a narrator, a, a third per, close third person narrator looking back on her childhood. So that, that was interesting. I think point of view is really just so interesting because it can just change the, the book completely. And as an editor, I published a book um, about point of view. I, I, I also have edited some craft books and I, uh, Lisa, um, Lisa Zeidner, um, her book, Who Says, I would check out. Um, it's a really interesting book about the, you know, different, the different points of view and she has examples from literature and um, I would highly recommend it. Great. Well, thank you both so much for being here tonight. It was a wonderful reading and conversation and thank you for asking each other such interesting questions. And thank you to our audience for your great questions. Um, we're really happy to have had you here and please everyone don't forget to buy The Deceptions and the Other Mother, um, preferably from your local bookstore. Um, and when you see Jill and Rachel in person, hopefully someday at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, they will sign your books for you. Yes, we would love that. Thank yeah, you we so would much. love to have you come back, Rachel, in person. Um, Jonathan Blunk, who's here in the audience tonight, actually thought you were going to be here in person and was so disappointed oh, to Jonathan. find out that it was on Zoom because he was inviting people to the train station for it. Um, oh my we goodness. Will, we will have you both in person um, when the pandemic is more over than it is now. Yes, I would love that. Next I would love that. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank Thanks everyone so for, yes. Thank Thanks for signing on. Thank you, Jill. Um, and yeah, everybody have a good evening. Jill, good luck with the rest of your yes. tour. I know it's just beginning. Well, I've done a lot of events already in September, but yes, thank you, Rachel. And I hope to meet you in person um, soon. And um, thank you everyone for being here. And thank you to Jennifer for creating this fun event. I enjoyed it. Thank you yes. all so much. I have, yes. Okay, good Bye. night. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.